quite the full house. Thank you for coming. Can everyone hear all right? Yes. Yes. Great. I'm going to give our tablet to me to walk on. So, welcome everyone to the Altadena Library as we put on another great program for you. We're very proud to have Michelle Zach and Jeffrey C. Stewart here today. Um, before we get started, I am going to introduce Sharon Sand. She is the chair of the Altadena Heritage. I and there she is. Thank you, Uni. We're uh, Altadena Heritage is thrilled to be co-sponsoring this event with the library. And I uh, just want to let you know, if you're not already a member of Altadena Heritage, we have some membership forms on the side. We'd love for you to join. We work to uh, uh, protect the culture, environment, and architecture of Altadena. We would love for all of you to be members. Thank you. Oh, yes. Uh, we have a third Thursday program uh, this coming uh, in, in February. So uh, it's going to be about the county permitting process. We'd love for you all to come out. It's going to be. We solicited questions from our members, and so. Those questions have been presented to the county planners who will come and talk about the, the process. And, and uh, it'll be at the community center from 7 to 9, third Thursday this month. I hope to see you all there. Okay. Do we start? Yeah, no, you can. <laughs> okay, number two is on over there for you. Okay. You want me to sit? That's okay. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming. And I, can you hear me all right? Yes. And I did want to mention um, that's Thursday, uh, February 21st. It's a th Thursday for our, it, we don't want it just to be a gripe session uh, with the county, but people are actually bringing questions and that have been circulated, so we're going to have some answers. And then I also wanted to mention on April 6th, we're going to have another co-sponsored a program with the library that we're very excited about. It's going to be Alta Diddy 2.0. I don't know how many of you went to our first one, but it's a song fest about Altadena, and we're, it's a little bit more fun maybe than the than the county permitting session. <laughs> And, and I've, I've already written the Leaf Blower Blues. But, and so it, it can be any kind of song. We're inviting people to write songs about Altadena. You can write a protest song. You can write a love song. Any kind of song. And then uh, as long as you contact us, we're going to have a, a, quite a show here uh, April 6th from 3 to 5. Wow. Everything's happening in Altadena. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, You'll have to return. Mike. Mike. Is, uh, Mike. February 21st is the one. So now it's my my great pleasure. I think most of you know me. I'm a local <laughs> historian, Michelle Zach. Uh, and this is my friend from high school and my colleague in history, uh, Jeffrey C. Stewart. We're really so excited to have him. He just won the National Book Award for his yeah. book on Alan Locke. We yeah. yeah. did a program several months ago back in uh, at Groen's, and that was before he won the the prize. But we and we didn't have this good a turnout, but there was a lot of interest then. And then you, I understand you just uh, won some other award, haven't you, from the? American historians? Yeah, but I'm not supposed to say it publicly. Oh, oh. <laughs> but yes, I've, I've been mind. blessed. Erase that. <laughs> I've been blessed, yeah. Can you hear me okay in this, Mike? Yes. Yeah. I can't see you there. All right. Well, um, why don't we get started? And, um, you know, I just want to say it's a real pleasure to be back here in Altadena. I think that. Uh, Altadena is a place that's often kind of subsumed or, you know, uh, overlapped or, I used the term earlier, which is not really a word, invisibilized <laughs> by Pasadena. 
and it's just such a distinctive uh, community, and it's a community that uh, you know I grew up in, and uh, I just really appreciate it, and I really appreciate being back here among you uh, because Altadena is still you know my home. I mean, I feel like it's my home, even though I'm in Santa Barbara right now. So thank you, Altadena. So, Jeff, can you start with just a brief biography of your uh, intellectual history or your personal history about, you know, what led you, you know, to, I know to you, worked moment, on the book right? for, you worked <laughs> yeah. on the book for about 30 years. Right, now. yes. Wow. Well, I mean, uh, those of you who know our family, uh, uh, it was really because of uh, my mother and uh, my sister, Joyce and Robinson, that uh, we came out from Chicago in uh, basically in 1964. Uh, so I was born in Chicago. I uh, came out here in 1964, and that's when I started at John Muir High School. Yeah. 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 John Muir. Yeah. 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 The Mustang. Yeah. 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 No, but I mean, it was incredible because um, you know, Chicago was a great experience for me on one hand, but also very difficult. And um, uh, my mother wanted to get me out of Chicago at the time. And um, I believe Joyce had come out and had been here, uh, was going to UCLA, was teaching, and uh, she made it possible for us to find a place here. And as I remember specifically, um, we have been looking in Los Angeles. Uh, I think we'd come out before and look for a place. And I think Joyce said something like, I won't make this all about you, Joyce, but, <laughs> but, uh, but she said something like, well, you know, if you come out to Los Angeles, we're gonna have the same problems that we've kind of been experiencing in Chicago. I mean, the, the shift is not going to be as much as you might want. And it was, um, I guess she was just going around with friends or whatever, found and located uh, Altadena. And, um, there was a house that was uh, brand new. It was incredible. It was the first time I ever lived in a house that was new. So we came out here. I started at John Muir High, 64 to 67. Uh, didn't know anybody. Uh, you know, in those days, if you didn't go to junior high, you had no connection in high school. So I joined the chess club. <laughs> that was a hit place, you know, <laughs> for me, you know. And it was great because you know, all the nerds were there, right? And uh, I, I was one of them. And um, but what's great about it is I often it was the first time I really learned how race can work for you, because we have these tours. We go to these other places, and I was like, I don't know, like seventh or eighth board. I mean, I wasn't really good, right? But I was pretty good, right? My friend Walter Shatford, who was uh, who passed away not too long ago, was I think first board, and he was one of the people who really gravitated toward me and befriended me, but we'd have these tournaments, and, um, you know, we'd go up in a tournament, of course, I'd be the only black person, right, you know, and so the person who was on the other team would sort of look at me and kind of go, oh, I got this. <laughs> you know, I just had that, I just, I could, after a while, you know, it happens, you know. I said, oh, okay. So I was really, I wasn't very good at attacking in chess, but I was really good at defense. And so the person would come flying in with their pieces, you know, with their queen, you know, they're just going to demolish me. And I would just lay, you know, and then I'd take one of their major pieces. And they'd go, oh, how did that happen? <laughs> I don't know how that happened. It just must be, must be magic. And then I win. So I actually won a disproportionate number of the game, which I shouldn't have won because of the racial attitudes that existed, right? So I said, well, at least I got that working for me. You know? I may be getting stopped by the you know, LA County sheriffs unnecessarily, or you know, a whole lot of other things. But uh, that was one of the really fun aspects of being in the uh, chess club. In a welcoming community, I found, uh, not only just in Altadena, but also, you know, of course, John Muir was in Pasadena, so it was a group of people. But I mean, you know, people like uh, Stuart Bennett from Linda Vista, and it was just a wonderfully welcoming interracial community, which I had never been in 
uh, uh, in Chicago, certainly as a student, I'll tell you Wasn't that. that one of the reasons that your mother wanted you to move from the south side of Chicago? Because she thought that, that she wanted for her son the benefit of an interracial high school. Yeah, and I mean, you know, my mother was um, never a segregated mind anyway. So she, you know, had a larger vision, I think, of... Uh, what we should be about. She, of course, wasn't opposed to black people. She was a race woman, uh, somewhat like Locke's mother, in, which you can pick up in the uh, in the uh, in the biography. But but at the same time, she uh, knew the struggles that uh, young black boys were going through in uh, Chicago. Uh, you know, fighting your way to class and fighting your way home, and so she wanted to. Uh, to uh, remove me from that, and um, so she did. And, and by the way, I was bused from the east side of, um, I was due to go to PHS, and then because of uh -oh. realigning re things on the last day of junior high, I was told that I was going to be going to John Muir, and it turned out to be, you know, the, the best thing that could have possibly happened to me. Because um, my sister had gone to PHS, so I didn't have to follow in her footsteps, <laughs> and I, I made lifelong friends. At, at John Muir. So, um, it is. There it is. There's John Muir. I couldn't get one from 67, but uh, maybe from my and yearbook. But uh, wanted... it was just such a beautiful, because you know, in Chicago, I went to Parker High, which is one huge building, like, like, like a prison. You know, you just, gotta, you just go in there and that was it, right? But the fact that there were different buildings in the high school, that was incredible to me. I mean, I just, I never, it was like a campus. It was like a university campus. It was, it was the magical. Next, the next one, I think. That's me, that's what I love. Yeah, I know, yeah. 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 Just keep moving. Well, yeah, yeah, I've been talking. Yeah, that's that California look. You should have always had that. That, uh, that, that book, but, uh, so, so I think are we gonna, should we move on a little bit to Alan Locke and, yeah. your, and your book, and just tell us about how you came to be writing this over right. a thirty-year period. Yeah. Well, so um, don't keep emphasizing how long it took. <laughs> I'm already carrying that. You know. uh, no, um, I, I went to John Muir, and then I went to UCLA. Uh, for two years, my mother wanted me to go to PCC, um, and the guidance counselor at high school, the only thing he ever did nice for me uh, was that he uh, told my mother that it would be inappropriate for me to go to PCC. He didn't invite me to the Brown reception because I had an afro. Uh, he said, you know, so, you know, it was all those kind of things, you know, it was always a complicated terrain, but it wasn't one that I couldn't navigate, so that was good. So I went to UCLA for two years. UCLA was, uh, was a great environment, but it was also, you know, the time of the uh, black consciousness movement, black power. I was in the BSU, and we were constantly inundated with pressure from the Black Panther Party on one hand, or Ron Karenga's uh, Us on the other, basically because we had a budget, <laughs> and, they, and they wanted part of that budget. Uh, but then that, every time I interacted with Ron Karenga, I remember what my sister said was that, you know, in an earlier iteration, he'd run for student body president at UCLA. So that always tempered my sense of how militant uh, 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 it was, because we thought being a, you know, student body president was a sellout. Uh, at UCLA. But anyway, I went there for two years. Uh, that was a time when um, when Bunch Carter was killed in Campbell Hall. And uh, then I went to, I transferred to Santa Cruz and um, uh, went there for two years. I was in philosophy and uh, I went up to Santa Cruz with my friend David Lees who uh, uh, basically got me into uh, going up to Santa Cruz doing a strike and we carried on a variety of conversations and arguments about the meaning of education, which led me to be able to transfer to Santa Cruz. And that was really key uh, because I had, you know, connections and individual relationships with faculty members, which was very difficult to have at UCLA. You know, I had seminars and debates with people like Martin Natanson and Norman O'Brown and others. And from that, I think, was a key for me then getting into Yale because they wrote letters of recommendation 
for my uh, graduate applications. It was one of those funny things. My great friend, uh, Pepe de Moica, who you may uh, know of, who lived in Altadena for many years, he was a counselor up there, which was kind of ironic, you know, because for him to be your counselor, you knew you were in some serious trouble. I mean, because he was crazy, you know. But, but he was really helpful when it came down to how to strategize your way through the system. He understood that. He taught me how to write the letter that I wrote to Yale. And um, that letter essentially got me uh, uh, admitted there, and so I went there. Uh, and I, that was another long haul. I was there for eight years. I remember my mother saying, I don't think he ever gets a degree. He just here so long. <laughs> so, you know, I'm kind of a long haul guy. You know? <laughs> But um, it was at Yale that uh, a professor, John Blassingame, came up to me and he could see that I was drifting because the man I'd come in to work with, um, Alan Trachtenberg, we had had a falling out. And after that, I had no, no patron. And you know, graduate school is very dependent on you know, having a senior, powerful professor be your patron, you know, to look out for you. And so he knew I was wandering around. And so he said, well, you're in philosophy, how about Alan Locke? So I hadn't heard about Alan Locke at all. So I did something on him in the graduate level, but after I did that, I kind of turned away from it. It was just, uh, uh, the project was big. I did, a, a, I think, a good study as a dissertation, but it wasn't a biography. It was really just looking at his ideas. And what I liked about his ideas is that he was a cultural pluralist. He was a person who believed that American culture was a plurality, not a single identity, and that all different groups of people ought to be able to maintain and, and cherish their heritage and culture at the same time of considering themselves to be uh, American. He worked with Horace Callan, who was a, a Jewish American philosopher, and they kind of came up with this concept of cultural pluralism. I was in philosophy, so that was my initial really encounter with him and desire to work on him. Can you speak a little bit to the fact that um, Alan Locke was a homosexual and that he went to Harvard at a, at a you know, 1905, was it? Yes, at uh -huh. the time when there were not, it was, I think, his outsider status was not only as, as a black man in America, but also as a homosexual. Yeah, well, this was something because, you know, for a long time, uh, no one mentioned while I was working on him that he was gay. Uh, and um, certainly uh, uh, John never did. And it was really about the end of me working on his, uh, the study for my dissertation that I came across, you know, conclusive evidence that he was gay. And so then I, so I felt kind of blindsided by that, you know, because, I mean, I could have been working on thinking about that a lot earlier. Of course, you know, in the 1970s, even the early 80s, the discussion of homosexuality uh, wasn't, uh, uh, you know, like as open as it is today, and particularly in black studies there was a pressure uh, around this because I remember I taught at um, Scripps College for a while and I was working on, I started really getting back into working on Locke when I was at Scripps in the 1980s and I remember having a meeting with a professor and talking with her about it and she said, you know, I just think it would be better for you just not to mention that. <laughs> and I said, well, okay, you know, I, you know and she, she explained that essentially that would uh, sabotage the basic idea behind the black biography, which is to find exemplary people who've been looked over because of racism, right? and you discover them and you bring them to the fore and then people go, oh, what an incredible person, blah, 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 they're, you know, the exemplary Negro thing, right? And then people, you know, and then people feel bad that they didn't get the attention that they deserved. And it all worked out, you know? And she wasn't the only one saying this. I mean, the other people were saying this and yet I, I found it difficult to move forward on that basis because so much of what was going on had that as a subtext. He wasn't explicit, he was closeted, but everybody in the know sort of knew that he was gay. And, I, and so that, that just became one of the additional factors of trying to work with that, as well as the fact that he was in aesthetics, which was not in the mainstream of black historiography. You know, you're supposed to be a civil rights leader to get the kind of attention. I mean, there were a lot of those 
those things to work through and to come up with sort of a way of talking about them. I think that was a key thing. Developing a language to talk about these multiple issues and the way they overlapped, I think was my biggest challenge, to really try to become the writer that could, could work on this. And this was something that was never mentioned in graduate school, that you know, that you really have a struggle of writing when you go into something like a biography, because it's really more like a fictional uh, uh, form than other forms of history. Well, getting to Locke, I think it would be really interesting for the audience, probably, uh, how many people here were, are familiar with, with Alan Locke? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, more than usual, right? Yeah. 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 You know, it, when I read your book, which I loved, and I, I honestly, I learned so much about American history and black history and Europe, even European history and World War II and World War I, it seems like uh, Alan Locke, he really didn't want to be a race man. He wanted to be into aesthetics and he was really interested in art history. And he didn't think that he should have to carry the burden, one, of being a black scholar and, you know, two, of, of being gay. He just was interested in what he was interested in mm -hmm. and how over the course of his you know, professional life, how he had to come to, to terms with yes, that. Yes. Uh, and that that's some of the most interesting writing in the book where you explain how he develops. Could you speak to that a little yeah. bit? Yeah, so he was born in Philadelphia, uh, 1885. That was one of the things. There were so many lies that I had to work through. So he put down he was born in 1886, but he's actually born in 1885. I don't exactly know why, right? Uh, but he was, you know, he was constantly revising his identity and his history. So that was another challenge. It's like to checking and go back and confusing uh, narratives. He, he basically said he grew up in a wealthy Philadelphia uh, 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 Brahmin black family, but in fact they were incredibly poor. But they had a cultural attitude of elitism that came from the fact that his grandfather, for example, had been a teacher, right? And he was always talking about how that he came from a group that had never been slaves. You see, so there's this whole group, which I talk about as kind of like the black Victorian that he came out of, that really saw culture as a way of sort of fighting racism, that you assimilated all of British particularly, culture and manners and knowledge and particularly behaviors and dress. You carried yourself in a certain way and then you would then maybe not get the brunt of racism. And so when he got to Harvard, uh, the problem then became that there were others who weren't taking that tag. And he felt uh, angry about the fact that he was assumed to be black or assumed to be, you know, someone who would want to fraternize. One of the things that was really complicated about him is he talked about other black students, you know, awfully. If you read it, you know, he just really talked about them and, you know, how that they were unclean and everything and they weren't cultured. But then, he would essentially be invited to their parties and he would go, right? He'd go to the party. Now the party was a particularly dangerous situation for him because he wasn't incredibly sophisticated and, you know, one would think eligible young man. And he was always mad that some guy was trying to fix him up with some woman, right? You know, and so that was incredibly worrisome. And at the same time, he would sort of hang out with the black people. See? So, so there was a contradiction often going on throughout his life. He was drawn to something and yet he was educated not to join in. And that became a kind of dynamic through his whole life. A person who was alienated from the very people who were the key to his, uh, his survival. And uh, I should say that he was only about what, five two and an incredible dad. That's when he had heels on. <laughs> no, no, he was four eleven, five feet, you know, and ninety nine pounds. He dressed, you know, wow. so beautifully and was cared so much about manners and was more middle class than the middle class. Mm -hmm. He was very Yeah, he looked he, down on the middle class. He was really you know what I mean? Keeping up appearances. And that's of course a hidden history itself. Uh, history of kind of a black aristocracy that uh, seems to be a contradiction in terms to many people, but uh, really the people who, you know, uh, pursued, particularly in Philadelphia, New York, uh, Washington, D.C., 
uh, people who uh, read widely, who traveled through Europe, who lived a what they call cultured lifestyle, despite the fact that doing that would lead them into conflicts. For example, if he went to hear uh, uh, an opera uh, in, in Baltimore, for example, he would often be excluded because he was black. And he would develop stratagems where he would get a particularly light-skinned student at Howard to go and get the tickets. And then they would then go in afterwards and then they would have to sort of decide whether they were going to make a scene and trying to get him to leave or sit in the balcony. So those kinds of things were always going on where I want to be part of this culture, but this culture doesn't want me to be part of it. And I'm not going to give in. I'm not going to, to, to tuck my tail and run. I'm going to continue to pressure them to essentially live up to the ideal which is universalism. So can you get into a little bit of his, his ideas about, um, he wanted, he really believed in multiculturalism and in... Yeah, this um, is a, that's the other thing about him, I should internationalism. say, Michelle, is that he was the first African-American Rhodes Scholar to Oxford. Mm -hmm. um, and um, on the one hand, he thought that was the perfect escape. You know, I'll go over to Europe, I'll escape American uh, uh, racism, um, and maybe I'll become a diplomat and, you know, live that life. He goes over there, but he runs into the Southern Road Scholars, who themselves were trying to, you know, uh, 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 show how sophisticated they were. And suddenly there's a black person over there who's also a Road Scholar. So they basically made his life uh, uh, miserable. And so I think that was the beginning of him realizing that he couldn't escape race and he was going to have to try to find some way to make race work for him along with his other uh, interests uh, in culture and art. Uh, he spent some time in Berlin um, where he sort of ran off to, and of course, those of you know that Berlin during the Weimar period was a, a haven of homosexuality, but also art and culture, and the, the promise for that brief uh, moment that Germany would become a very progressive and liberal culture, uh, which he found in Berlin a metaphor for the type of city that he wanted to be uh, involved in. He also discovered uh, African art over in uh, Berlin and realized that Europeans were actually uh, incredibly interested in African art, which was not being shown in the United States. And that kind of gave him the inkling, okay? If Europe and modernists are interested in things African, maybe if I can promote those things, I can have a career as a curator, or an esthete, but also someone who can see or argue that art can be a path to liberation. <coughs> and so that's why he came back uh, after his mother passed in the 1920s. He was the person probably most associated with creating uh, what's called the Harlem Renaissance, at least <coughs> being an advocate of it, being a uh, publicist for it, a PR person. Uh, obviously, the, the Harlem Renaissance was dominated by the writings of Zora Neale Hurston and County Cullen and Langston Hughes, but there needed to be somebody who would make the argument that this is more than just a sprinkling of writers and art, this is a movement. And so that's kind of how he did it. This, uh, cover of survey graphic is kind of a text really about him. Uh, that picture there is of Roland Hayes who was a uh, concert singer who uh, sang a German leader uh, on the concert stage in Europe, got a lot of recognition for that, but also sang the spirituals. His program would always include European and also African American music to try to make that argument that these were both forms of culture that needed to be uh, in conversation. And then you can see the background there. This whole text is done by a German artist, Vino Rice, who actually participated in and helped uh, create the images for this movement. Again, that was kind of Locke's thing. Not so much like the black arts movement where it was supposed to be exclusively a black uh, movement. Here he thought this was a black based movement but that whites could participate in and that there would be a space for kind of a new America to emerge out of this kind of conversation. 
I, I think it's important to say a lot of this is happening um, after the Great Migration and so many um, blacks left the South and moved up to New York and Chicago and we're creating uh, whole new ways of, of being and new, you know, a, a new culture really because they were leaving the environment of the South that was so connected with slavery and, and starting a whole new, new projects and the, the new Negro um, a lot of that idea that of Locke's was that liberation through art. He truly believed this, that this would be uh, to channel all of the, the anger and the rage and every, you know, the racism. If, if black people could be successful in making art, he thought this was a real road, um, you know, a, a road to take that, that, would, that would lead to liberation. Yeah, and you know, the migration thing I think is really important too, the, the physical mobility. Yeah, what he was inspired by the Great Migration is that people had on their own decided to leave the South and come North. They didn't decide that because someone told them it was almost a spontaneous movement that coincided with World War I. And his approach was always, yes, there were negative conditions in the South, but the key was is that black people in the South particularly young people, had a new vision of opportunity and that that's what led them to leave. So he was always that philosopher. It's an idea that you have, an idea about yourself and, and what you could become that would lead you to take action, not simply that you're being pushed. I mean, obviously, they're being pushed by social forces, but his idea is the new Negro is someone who is recreating him or herself by her idea of himself and playing that out. And this kind of was one of the things that kind of re resonated uh, with me because I remember growing up, my mother would always talk about the Great Migration and uh, how uh, her father had migrated out of the South and come to Indiana Harbor because he had a, a desire not to have his children grow up in the South. So along the way, there would be little you know, echoes that I would have uh, that would tell me that this is really an important point to make the, uh, uh, through the book. And so, and before we then, we're going to move on to pretty soon to how this, you know, what all this has to do. With all roads the, lead to Altadena. Yeah. You know that. <laughs> but could you talk just about some of the um, artists who who he mentored? He was um, very close to Langston Hughes. Yes, I think I have a Zora picture of here um, of. Uh, uh, some of the Langston Hughes, um, E. Franklin Frazier, uh, behind him Rudolph Fisher. Um, I can't remember. Well, I can't remember the man behind him. He published them, right? He yes. Helped, he helped yes. get these people published. Yes. So he was. The so, but this is also, I think, important because it's a, a visual a representation of the new Negro, right? In three-piece suits, they're all educated, college educated. Uh, but at the same time, proud of being black. You see, that, that was the combination that sort of, kind of, his experience of not being proud and then going through the process of realizing how point that was. The, the younger people really taught him mostly about how to be a new Negro more than, uh, than, than he taught them. And then, of course, the women artists who were very important uh, to uh, the, the new Negro movement. I have to say that you know one of the struggles in you know this book was uh, his tremendous you know misogyny and uh, negative attitude toward women. Um, some women, okay, women who played the mother role or those who were powerful or reminded him of his mother, uh, he'd do almost anything for them. But uh, women who were peers, perhaps competitors, uh, people like Jesse Fawcett and others. And this was one of the experiences I had. I would go to these conferences or workshops, and I'd come in talking about Locke. And it'd usually be some very well-informed black feminist <laughs> theoretician in there. And so what about Locke? And, I, and she kicked my butt. And he did this, and he did that. And after a while, I just got to the point. I said, you know, I, it's not my role to defend him. Yeah. Okay, it's my role to sort of say, okay, these are some of the reasons, but these are essentially uh, failures of his vision. So I think that's the other thing that you have to come to grips with when you do somebody's uh, life like this, is you have to admit their failures and let them speak through the book. And he was always 
um, would have suitors, women who were after him, and he couldn't just say, hey, I'm gay. He would have to often like let them down, and, and sometimes in such a way that they would get really angry. Yeah, uh, yeah, like, like he would tell his mother, yeah. she's not cultured, <laughs> right? <laughs> so like, you know, like you're thinking, how many guys have ever used that as an excuse? <laughs> Up there, you know? <laughs> I'm sorry, mother. She's not coaching. You know, therefore, I don't want to be around her. Well, okay. And his mother, you know, he always said his mother understood, but in some ways, I don't think she really completely understood because she said, well, she went to like, you know, she went to Cornell. She's got a master's in French. You know, I mean, what, you know, what are you talking about? Said, well, you know, she just doesn't know how to act. <laughs> That's one thing about these Victorians is they can always reserve judgment. They find some other basis for why you didn't live up, you know, and it was always basically in their in, in their judgment. So he was he was vicious with that kind of thing. So are we just about to move yeah, okay. on to Yeah, well so so the, I want to just go back the, here and the just, nexus between Yeah, 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 yeah. Well so one of the things that really struck me that was a uh you know, his life is one thing, right? But there were also certain ideas that he came up with that I thought were really remarkable. And of course, if you go back here, you see it says there, Survey Graphic, that was a magazine at the time. And then he came up with this title, Harlem, Mecca of the New Negro, right? Mm -hmm. And so that was all about the idea that at the time, even in the 20s, people were beginning to call black communities ghettos. And he said, no, this is not a ghetto. He said, this is actually a crucible, a place where different groups of people coming in are mixing together and forming something new, a new kind of subjectivity, a new way of being in the world. Because they're together, they're interacting with one another in a way they wouldn't have ever had they not come to the same place. And this, of course, you know, in a say, what do you say, uh, like art was also something that could come out of that, right? That the colliding of these individuals, if they essentially came and expressed their culture, could actually produce something new. Because the thing about Harlem is it had an audience. It had consumers. It had people who appreciated the culture. So that a lot of artists would come through Harlem, even if they didn't live there because it was a place where they felt people appreciated what they were trying to do. There was a dialogue going on between the artist and the audience that was unique. And that was what made the art special, not just simply having a bunch of geniuses, you know. It was being in a particular kind of enabling space that really allowed the artist to blossom and to become something more than he or she would uh, elsewhere. And of course, this is something that kind of, uh, uh, this Just is like a, Altadena. Yeah, <laughs> right. This is, a, this is a kind of a visual uh, representation of what he really wanted to happen, that uh, uh, young people would see art. This was an exhibit that he helped curate in 1939. And that the people would be inspired by an image of themselves against the domination. Because I think it's really important that, you know, throughout this period of time, 1900 to 1940, there's just a slew of negative images constantly being projected at black people. I mean, yeah. and I got this from doing the research. I do be looking in a newspaper for something, and I'd see one of these images, you know, and I go, God, you know, they're all over the place. And there was a kind of brainwashing that that kind of imagery, racist imagery, was destined and doing. So he wanted to create counter images that would sort of reset your brain and perhaps in some way begin a process of decolonization internally. That was the aspect of art as a means for liberation. It would change your attitude about yourself. So uh, this, of course, brings us to <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm saying Altadena is not Harlem, okay? So I'm not trying to say that. But I think that Altadena, for me personally, um, was interesting because, you know, the, the image of Harlem is of a largely segregated space that's producing this. But Altadena was an integrated space. I'm not saying that there were problems, but 
I think this was a space where, when we came here in uh, 1964, uh, you know, we lived on a street, Loma Alta, in which there were African Americans like uh, Lavinia Strothers who lived across the street, and then there was a woman whose name I can't remember who lived next to us who had a horse ranch, right? I mean, the whites and blacks actually lived on Loma Alta. And I know, of course, you know, east of Lake was a whole nother story, but on the west side, at least, there was, you know, a kind of interaction going on that I think was relatively unusual in the United States uh, uh, in 1964. Because if you remember, 1964 is a year for the passage of the Civil Rights Act. So, I mean, that obviously it had to be passed for some reason. Right? <laughs> so, so uh, you know, it wasn't the case that every place was like Altadena. And Altadena was also, I think, different from Pasadena because often when we would sort of go down in Pasadena, it was just a completely different feel, particularly when you were down, say, on, you know, Lake and Col below Colorado, the South Carolina, Pasadena arena was just a different kind of feeling. And, Altadena was almost like Harlem in the sense that it was at the top. It was it was away, and that awayness allowed for certain things to go on that perhaps wouldn't go on uh, downtown in Pasadena. I, I'd like to just mention that in 1960, um, Altadena was uh, only four percent of people of color. So in that one um, decade, things really changed, and there was a diaspora of people of color coming up to Altadena. And this had to do with redevelopment in Pasadena. Pasadena tore down and rebuilt 20% um, of all of its housing mm -hmm. in that decade. The Pepper Project, they were tearing up for freeways, which the roots of freeways are always very political, and they tended to run through um, black areas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So right. at, yeah. in this period of the 60s, especially from right around when, when um, your family came, there was a huge shift in um, in just in the demographics, and I think that that had um, it had a really positive and then some some negative effects, like depending on your point of view. But it did create a kind of crucible where a lot of a lot of art started to happen. A lot of musicians came here. Um, a lot of mixed race couples. A lot of gay people. It was a, in that way. It did slightly reflect some of the things that happened in Harlem. Yeah, it was roomy. I think that was the thing that I, I remember about it. That there was room. There was a, you know you could you could wander around. There was the mountains. I mean, there were trails. Uh, you sort of didn't have a feeling of being so tightly bounded, which I had when I was in Chicago. That you know, I mean, everything was very uh, uh, you know it was a hugely built environment in Chicago, and and this was kind of a uh, it felt fresh. It felt like there was a uh, possibility. Uh, for for finding a new way for yourself. Let's just go over here. And this is a picture that uh, Michelle uh, uh, gave me or provided me uh, a burial in 19. Well, yeah, this is Owen Brown, um, his burial, and and even this is going way back. This is in 1889. But it's so interesting to even to have this picture from the late 19th century with so many people of different races and black and white, almost half and half. So that there is something spatial also, it seems, something about Altadena that is, you know, because of the room, because it's not on the way to other places, a lot of people come here to get away from other, you know, just to get away that, that I think has made Altadena, um, you know, the, the, the sort of place that your family came to and that, that you know, is, it's not by any way unique. However, at the time it was unusual. Yeah, that, that it was unusual the integration that happened here fairly early. So I want to go back here to Chicago just for a second because I want to do get a little bit into some of the artists uh, quickly before we kind of uh, bring it to a conclusion and open up for questions because I really do want to have kind of more of a dialogue. But this was a poster from the American Negro Exposition 1940. So this is interesting for me because this is an overlap between Alan Locke and Charles White. So Locke was brought in by Claude Bar Barnett, who was the uh, head of the uh, uh, sort of a, a black newspaper service. 
to curate an exhibition for this exposition. This exposition was sort of commemorating, I don't know why they picked it, because 1863 was emancipation in 1940, but a lot of stuff was going on in 1940 to celebrate this. And of course, Chicago was one of the most accomplished cities in terms of black entrepreneurship uh, at the time. I mean, in terms of people who had businesses um, and that sort of thing. And so I love this, this picture. It's kind of a, 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 I don't know what you would call it, uh, almost Polynesian deco uh, that, they, that they decided to, to put up here. Because you see, that's always what's going on. Like, how black are you going to let the representation be? This is, a, this is a, always an issue when I was, when I was doing this research. And then, I wanted to put this up here. Uh, I dug this out of my archives. Uh, because uh, uh, my mother uh, owned a uh, beauty shop, and uh, my father uh, had a, a, a hair preparations. And of course, you know, when you had something, you had to have it insured. But uh, uh, this is an example of uh, my mother and my sister. Uh, in the, and it was put on the cover of a, uh, the Jackson Mutual. But you can sort of see a little bit, I think, in that the way in which they're presenting themselves. You see, this is, this is already that new Negro kind of, uh, you know, very attention to detail, self-representation, dress, uh, looking forward uh, as a citizen with power and ingenuity and beauty. And then here is the cover of uh, a exhibition catalog that came out of this Negro exposition with um, uh, a drawing by Charles White. Um, uh, there were no crops this year, which won the first prize at this. And I thought this was very interesting because Locke must have been involved in selecting uh, this image because he was head of all of the committees. And it's a very interesting uh, image because if you think about it, it's not the image back here of kind of celebration of progress and, and you know things are going well. It's really a, a, a critique of the fact that even though we're in 1940, we're still trapped in a uh, peonage uh, agricultural system where if for whatever reason the crops don't grow, you are basically left with nothing. And so I think that's one of the things that you see with Charles White, and particularly in the 1930s and 40s, is social realist feeling that, okay, it's okay to celebrate, you know, accomplishment, the kind of new Negro, that's cool, but let's not forget how the masses of black people are continually to be ground down by the economic system in the United States. I think this is part of what I would call the labor and working class uh, leftist con consciousness that was always in Charles uh, White's uh, work, and uh, you know, de you know, dignifying the black worker rather than the elite. And this, of course, is always a problem for Locke, because he's got to come to terms with the fact that it's the working class that are actually the heroes of the culture. And he's, you know, not. So how do I use that? How do I come to grips with that and make it something? And so I was just, I always felt glad that he at least chose what would be not the usual kind of image that you would think an esteemed kind of person uh, would, would uh, take. So white, of course, as I'm sure all of you know, is part of a, this diaspora, right? This migrating out from the East Coast, um, uh, to the West Coast, obviously, for, for health reasons, <coughs> but um, particularly also, I think when this uh, picture here is from the, the, the 60s, uh, shifting himself, uh, becoming uh, much more aware of a kind of uh, feminist uh, representation, uh, the black woman subject. I was looking through his work, and uh, of course you all know there's an exhibit of Charles White's work it's at the uh, LACMA. No, it's, uh, it's at MoMA. It's coming to LACMA right. in March. Right. Really? Yeah. So we can all see it. Yeah, yeah. But I think it's really great because it really does talk about the issue of how his art changed in Southern California. Um, and it really becomes uh, a, a, a lot more imaginative and spectral and uh, almost otherworldly. Not so much just documenting the actual position of labor and what have you. 
Also, uh, Altadena is where he uh, uh, lived, a kind of sanctuary uh, for interracial uh, uh, couples at that time. I also say that we don't want to overstate the, the, the sanctuary aspect of Altadena because we always had the Los Angeles County Sheriffs <laughs> to remind you of where you is. Okay, yeah, right. uh, and you know, it, 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 you may think it's the promised land, uh, but... Uh, it's relative. Yeah, it's relative, relative, but they, they definitely, they were probably representative, my mother always believed they were representatives of their own diaspora from Oklahoma and Texas and coming out here, you know, and saying, look, we're going to make sure the promised land is not going to be for you, but nevertheless, uh, certain things were allowed in Altadena that weren't very frequent other places. Also, another thing I want to just mention is that, that, that strong historical consciousness that comes out of Charles White, and I'm particularly pleased that the Heritage Foundation and all that, this idea of heritage, I think, is very important uh, in the work of, uh, of, of Charles White, and particularly African-American artists in um, Altadena in Southern California during the 1960s. I think that historical consciousness uh, is very strong uh, and, and is shared by many. Here's a picture that uh, Michelle also gave me of some of the people. Maybe you can talk a little bit about this picture, Michelle. This is Sidney Poitier and Charles White and Ivan Dixon, who used to play uh, Sidney Poitier's body double, but he went on to be a, uh, an actor himself with Tony Curtis. And all three of these guys lived in Altadena. Yeah. So, and Sidney Poitier is the one who first told Charles White about Altadena. And uh, I think uh, Charles White was doing some scene design uh, for the movies. And he was, um, and he lived over on um, Harriet Street, not for a long time. I know Michelle Hunneman's in the audience. Oh, El Nido. He lived on, on Michelle Hunneman Street for, you know, just a certain amount of time before he moved to Beverly Hills. <laughs> but he had, he had, he had lived up on, uh, on Marengo, and there were so many people in the arts, in the music and film and visual arts, uh, that, that came to Altadena. Wow. Tony Curtis did with you? Yeah, no, he didn't live here, but they were, they were working on a film, obviously, in, in this picture. Wow, that's wonderful. So, yeah. yeah, so I want to just quickly, I mean, I, we could go into more detail, but I, I, I particularly want to um, mention a few other artists who are maybe less well-known to you than Charles White, but Yvonne Mayo. I remember very distinctly that my mother knew Yvonne, uh, and of course, unfortunately, now I realize, you know, it. 15 or 16 or 17, I was didn't have the consciousness uh, to actually appreciate uh, her. I know uh, my sister interacted with her some, but he has a, just a powerful piece that sold uh, recently. Cotton is still king. Again, this this historical political. It was a, a definite political consciousness that came through uh, the art of uh, Southern California artists at this time, and also. Uh, particularly uh, those in Altadena. Um, I had some also some uh, pictures that uh, 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 cards or postcards that uh, Raina uh, uh, Stewart uh, has here. One of the things I think about Altadena that's important to say is that there were, and it was an appreciative collecting uh, group of people. In other words, you know, people interacted with the artists. Uh, they. They, they, they purchased their artists. And also, it seems like the Altadena artists made their art available to people who didn't have a lot of money. I mean, certain people obviously had a lot of money and certain you know, large works of art which, uh, which uh, Yvonne uh, worked on frequently. But almost all of the artists seemed to have a populist uh, attitude or a perspective. They would make cards. Uh, obviously, Charles White had those uh, those uh, the prints that, that he sold, this idea that's yeah. still that kind of Alan Locke idea that art for the people, that art does a work in the community, in shaping people's consciousness that is important and that's why they made that art available. 
And from the 60s, I think a, a place that, when you think of Altadena and art in the 60s, you think of the Zorthian Ranch, which mm -hmm. was um, mm -hmm. a place that was really a multiracial space. Um, Alan is, is Zorthian is here today. He might be able to comment on that later, that it was a place that even if everyone didn't live in Altadena, they came through Altadena. A lot of artists came through and then went up to the Zorthian Ranch and uh, Charlie Parker and, and we have a film clip of John Odebridge, right, Odebridge? Right. Yes, uh -huh. So there were, it, it, to have a place that was like a magnetic pole for artists right in Altadena, I think ended up um, making a big difference up here. Because I think you had space, you know, you could have space to have a studio, to, you know, that, uh, you know, is really important to artists and it also wasn't overwhelmingly expensive like like Beverly Hills, for example, that you mentioned. You know, so the square foot cost, I'm sure, in Altadena in the 1960s was nothing compared to that in, in Beverly Hills. And you need that kind of roominess uh, to thrive as an, as an artist. Uh, I also wanted to mention just that, you know, I just started thinking about this, that, uh, you know, some of the artists that influenced uh, some of these artists, when I was looking at this piece by... Uh, Yvonne Mayo, I was thinking about Katie Colwitz and how um, her work was very influential among some African American artists uh, during the 1960s. And it really is a, um, uh, a project really to document some of the influences and cross currents of influence that went on during the 19, uh, 1960s. Here's a photograph of Yvonne uh, sort of stage before uh, a, a work of art. Um, uh, incredible uh, person with magnetic presence. Um, these these pieces here I'm just showing. These are from uh, my sister's uh, collection. Uh, Bob Smith, many of you may know, who was uh, uh, did prints and watercolors, and also apparently um, uh, Joyce was telling me uh, would sell these cards um, at parades. Uh, he did a, a number of very interesting religious uh, paintings that would uh, were appropriate for uh, uh, Christmas cards and others. Then there's Nathaniel Bustan who has this piece, a mass series, uh, which is uh, uh, quite uh, quite uh, striking. You see this sort of uh, uh, affection for mask and Africa. Uh, an artist? Yes, uh huh. Uh huh. Joyce knows more about him than I do. And then uh, John Otterbridge, I think most people know a lot about him. Yes. Uh, uh, his pieces that, uh, and again, the ethnic uh, heritage pieces, the sculpture, uh, powerful sculptures that uh, that he. Uh, you were born did. in Turkey. Okay, here's this thing. Should we? And you came with your family to the U.S. to a raft that included Italy. So we just wanted to show a tiny bit of this. What brought you to Los Angeles? Get to the. Yeah, why don't you? Let's see if I can do it. This is uh, Gerard Zorthian, Alan's dad, and it's it's a 30 minute one. We just wanted to show a bit of it. Let me see if I can make it. There you go. Yeah, it's right down the bottom. And then my fourth year. Yeah, oh, let's see. Um, yeah. Oh, here. Yeah. Honors of the Year and won a fellowship to study oh, in the American Academy in Rome, where I went for a year and a half. It was one of the great periods of my life. This is with John Otterbridge. I saw him. I was on the insurance. I gave the first prize to John Outerbridge. Mm -hmm. And then, before the thing opened, I bought it. Which is very unethical. Um, <laughs> Can you turn it up? As far as I'm concerned, he's in the <coughs> And we came to realization, we started to miss. That's how I feel with all the time. I mean, in fact, that as a kid, not knowing anything about the museum or about art, I remember when I was very small, the most fascinating thing to me at times was to sit by a window and watch raindrops run. Mm. Oh, man, that's magic stuff. <laughs> to me, that was art. Mm -hmm. Or to find a bird nest. 
and, and examine how it was put together. And I think that what we uh, disregard is the fact that somehow the human spirit <coughs> has its own notions about art. Life has become so market-oriented that it doesn't breathe anymore. It doesn't always pulsate in the way that it should. Many of the people who practice and practice and believe and practice and do what they can't help from do are the people that are wounded with a blessing. Simply wounded with a blessing. You're, you're, you're blessed because you are that way, but you're wounded at the same time because it's difficult for you to fit into the marketplace. We have to talk specialist in everything. Mm. An engineer, uh, an architect, a, a lawyer, etc. Uh, it seems to me that the Renaissance artists Da Vinci was not the exception. All of them, if they were artists or painters, they knew enough about architecture and sculpture and, and city planning, and philosophy and everything else. And each time you do something else, you're bringing something into your original thing that you couldn't have unless you didn't. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that is so fundamental that you don't do just one thing. Because after a while it becomes dollar and dollar and dollar. You have to bring other things into it. And when I taught at Otis, I remember once, um, from 60 to 64, at one point, three boys and one girl called me on the, in the hallway. And they said, why do we have to draw from the model. <laughs> it was like somebody threw cold water on my head. <laughs> I said, well, God, I don't know. I said, we know more about our bodies than anything else. We know that one arm is longer than the other. Jesus, we're not in our, we learn proportions, form, how to express form, etc." They said, no, no, no. Why do we have to draw at all? I said, <laughs> <laughs> so that's the kind of conversations that went on a lot uh, uh, about the meaning of art. I just want to finish up here uh, with uh, uh, this one, which is essentially about someone we haven't mentioned so far. Octavia Butler. Oh, yeah. 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 And then we want to have a little discussion because we, we're going to be trying, to, get this to, trying to keep this within an hour and a half Sorry, minutes. Sorry, it's like, turn it up. Can you turn up the, the volume? Is, this, is Uni here? How can we turn this up? But also because of the power of imagination. Uni, can you help us turn this up? This, sorry. Otherwise, we can just move into the discussion this And she learns what it's like to be a slave. That was crucially a time travel story, and there's not a shred of science. This is loud as it's going to Can anybody hear this? Yeah, okay, you know, I, I'm sorry. But I, probably a lot of you, I know there was a, a, a program here about Octavia. Is it louder? Put the mic by the speaker. Put the mic by the speaker. I only know a few of the words. Uh, 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 
pass over to talk with. I so I think if you can't hear, we this is the Anyway. All right. Well, thank you very much. Sorry about the electronic. Katie did live up here in Altadena. She lived in several apartments in Pasadena and Altadena when she was younger. And uh, of course, it, uh, when she finally was successful and she could buy a house, she moved to Altadena and she lived here for around, I think, eight or nine years. And she went to John Muir. And she went to John Muir. Yeah, Muir. <laughs> <Mirror. laughs> so I think, Jeff, didn't you want to open it up to, to some sure, yeah, let's, uh, comments um, at this point? And we um, have a, a, a microphone. There's no such thing as a, a stupid question, but there is a very long question. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so if you could just, if anyone has questions or, or comments, comments or keep, keep them um, concise, and, and uh, Uni's going to uh, share the microphone, right? I'm going to share the microphone. Bailey and I are both going in. I'm going to ask you guys to share the microphone. So okay. We have two for the audience. Good. All right. Good. It'll make it go a little bit faster. Right. Okay. I think this one's stronger anyway. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I just had one thing that I wanted to add when you were back there with the group of four, the Magnificent Four with Ivan Dixon. Yes. And some people may remember he and his wife had a... Uh, store down on South Fair Oaks, right south of Colorado. I didn't know that they were artists, but I spent a lot of time in there, and they carried Charles White's prints in there. Fortunately, I gave them away as gifts and didn't sell them myself, myself, but it was a really interesting time in the 60s before they then did the re, um, uh, renovation and had made what's Old Town, but this was a very different Old Town at that time. Oh, yeah. Yes. Any other question, comment? Okay. Well, for most of us, Hen's Tooth is still going on, and that came out of a desire for uh, the family or for the artists to, uh, to be able to have a place where artists could come and that they could uh, do their art right on the outside. And although Hen's Tooth is still there, right there, uh, Lost Robles and Altadena, I don't know how many. I mean, Woodbury. Uh, Hen's Tooth. Square. Yeah. And I mean, now it's a market and it's got other things, but if for years ago, that was the desire. Could you speak louder, please? That was the desire to have a place where artists could be right here in the community, show their wares, and as you say, uh, be able to have the community buy them without having great expenditures of just a little history on that. And so that survived? Yes, it mm -hmm. survived. Great. Yes, it's still there. Is, is Altadena still uh, a, a mecca or a haven for contemporary artists? Are still artists moving into this area, taking yeah. advantage yeah. of yeah. it? Yeah. 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 And musicians, particularly musicians, TV that are here. Actually, a comment on Altadena as a place for artists. Being unincorporated, LA County has the least layers of prevention of what you can do, say, in your garage, a studio space. So let's, yeah. let's think about that going forward. <laughs> The one thing that Altadenans can agree on usually is that they don't want to become um, part of Pasadena. And every time there have been uh, campaigns to incorporate, it's always lost, you know, by a big margin. Even well-funded, thoughtful campaigns, it seems that a lot of people in Altadena just prefer to be left alone. <laughs> be far from the ruler. Uh, I wanted to talk to Mr. Stewart. Um, could you talk a little bit about the process of writing your biography? I'm very interested in sort of the development of a book and how it comes to be. Though so you, you left us at your dissertation. Right, <laughs> right. Yes, well, I mean, I think that I went away from the project for uh, a, a while. And uh, as you know, Helen, when I came to Scripps College, 
I, um, I had left the East Coast. I had spent a year at UCLA teaching, and I came to Scripps College, and I was teaching there. And um, one of the things, of course, always when you're a historian is where are your archives? Because this is based mainly on primary sources. So my archives were at Howard University. And um, at various points, Howard would discover that it had more of his papers than they had let me know in the beginning. Uh, I think there was a process of declassifying certain parts of it. And even after I stopped working on it, they still magically found other things, like, uh, for example, his ashes, uh, which I had never found uh, in there. And I believe someone deposited it there. But nevertheless, so I was in, you know, I was in California, and um, I realized at that point in the 80s that if I wanted to continue to work on the book, which I had stopped working on, I would have to go back to the East Coast. So basically I found a way, I got a, uh, uh, a fellowship at the Smithsonian um, and went back. And what was magical about that is I just was there and I really couldn't write on the biography, but I discovered Reno Rice's artwork. So the, the, the artwork that I had up here in the, the beginning, I realized that these, uh, drawings uh, were, were not actually just drawings, okay? Because when I worked on it earlier on, I just thought of them as things that were like, you know, images, right? That were in magazines. But when I went to the portrait gallery, I realized that these were full-size portraits that were hanging in the gallery, which I had never really uh, figured out before. And so that led me to start working on the artist, Vino Rice, for a while. To sort of come off of lock for a while and look at this kind of anomaly that a German artist not only illustrated the survey graphic, but also went on to uh, illustrate the new Negro. And Locke actually got criticism from some African Americans who said, well, you know, this is this book about the New Negro, and you're letting this German uh, illustrate it, even though there were drawings in there and illustrations from Aaron Douglas, for example. But nevertheless, he said, no, I have, uh, the, the art itself is of such superior quality and completely lacking in the kind of self-consciousness that he felt he saw in even some African-American artists in the 1920s, that he wanted to use them because he wanted Rice's work because it was like almost the aura of the new Negro came through the portraits. And so I worked on that for a while, and I did a Smithsonian exhibition on that. And so as I looked at Locke's relationship with Rice when I did the catalog essay, that sort of got me back into it. Because I realized that one of the things about Locke was he was into visual arts. You know, much African American black studies is really not driven by visual arts. I mean, some is, but not much. It's usually historical, it's sociological, it's literary. And even among people like Du Bois and others, you know, the visual was there, but it's not the main thing. But he really was uh, a curator, someone who believed in the power of visual art. And so that kind of got me uh, back into uh, to, to, to working on it. And then, you know, I did another exhibition, uh, largely because of the reputation I got for the one on Rice, on Paul Robeson. And when I looked at Paul Robeson, that was very interesting because he was somebody who Locke had a kind of ambivalent relationship with. I worked on Paul Robeson, uh, his sort of, you know, tremendous courage and, and, and the tragedy of, of, of his experience. And that also was a way of writing about the book, but not writing about Locke. So I wrote about pieces of the book in separate places. That, the, the sort of uh, Euro racial internationalism of the 20s with the, with the Rice one, and then the more political, militant, uh, communist, leftist part of uh, the 1930s. And that's what actually made me realize that Locke had moved to the left during the 1930s. And uh, then, of course, I also was able to discover and find his FBI file 
and Ooh. find that the FBI were actually tracking him fairly closely uh, during the 1930s. This soon be, you know, most of the, the radicals in the 30s would say, oh, Locke, you believe too much in, in art, and you know, you think art's going to do everything. So as he tried to become much more militant in his notion that art was a, a sign of revolution, people were listening. And uh, so I discovered, for example, that the, the FBI went into his house and took samples of his typewriter uh, and various things that they were tracking him. So I guess I would have to say is that I broke it down and that I, it was such a big project, I worked on pieces of it through other people who were in a relationship with him. And that gave me a different perspective on him. And I realized that, that his life, particularly he was a fairly lonely person, it really was driven by his friends and enemies and colleagues and that that's really the story of his life is his interaction with all these other figures most of whom had larger personalities than him but yet he was also somebody who constantly uh, transformed himself because of the people he was engaged with and I think that was probably the biggest thing that was a, a kind of a insight that I got that that it was through his relationships with people that they generally led him to change his perspective. He got ideas out of relationships with certain people. And so that allowed me to sort of, I was always like working with a kind of map of his ideas, but I couldn't always connect that with his life. And so seeing those relationships up close gave me a way into talking about them together. I think we have time for one last question, because we're, is that, oh here, we have it. Hi, Jeffrey, thanks so much for coming. So I want to follow up a little bit on Helen's question, and that is, you made reference to how we as historians are not necessarily prepared to write biography. You said biography is more like writing fiction. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate on that? Well, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, that was, one of the things that I uh, struggled with was how to write the book. So there are certain people who just write what is kind of like a history of the person's ideas. And they, you know, they put in a few facts, right? But it's all about their ideas, okay? And then there are other people um, who almost totally focus on their day-to-day, -day, right? And so I remember talking with Arnold Rampersar, and he was saying, you know, I was trying to talk to him about it. He said, no, no, no. You have your stack of cards. You go from day to week to month. You know, because the whole thing is you can't get rid of the person until they're dead. So you, so you gotta bury that sucker. Well, in my case, my case, put him on the shelf. You know, I mean, you, 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 you know, you, so, so that's like a real pressure, right? What did he do? Where is he going? You know, all that. So that was that was hard, and then the benefit for the Locke study is that he had all these letters to his mother. I would say probably maybe five to 10,000 letters between him and his mother. And then later on, he had the relationship with Mrs. R. Osgood Mason, who was his mother's surrogate, and that's probably a couple thousand. But when you didn't have that, what do I say, you see? That became a problem. And so that's when I said, well, by this point, you know, after all this time, I should be able to imagine certain things and then go and try and check and see if I have evidence for them. So that, you know, uh, particularly the, the scene of his uh, uh, mother's wake, for example. I heard stories about it, right? But then I had to say, okay, what was that day really like? And then I kind of played out that day. And then I then went back and checked other things. And I said, oh, yeah, there actually is a lot to this. So I think you have to use your imagination when you're doing life writing in a way that perhaps, you know, other forms of history don't require. Jeffrey, I think maybe we should close this out. Why don't you explain what he did at his mother's way? Well, no, you got to read the book. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't pay me like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it's worth the whole, in fact, somebody told me that. They said the whole book was worth, oh, yeah, was, the first read. chapter was worth first uh, yeah. the, the first part. Sure. So, uh, <laughs> but I will say, this is not a recommendation as to how you should handle 
uh, the death of a loved one yourself. <laughs> uh, this is not a how-to manual. Uh, it's just how did it happen. So, thank you very much. I don't have any, oh, okay. uh, but they are at Froman's. I think they did yeah. restock. Oh, okay, and you can also get, take them out of the library here. I think that friends of the Altamina Library purchased five or ten copies to to pass around. Is that so? Yes. <laughs> so some of you may actually see that there are free copies of his book floating around Altadena. The Friends of the Altadena Library generously donated 10 copies to the community and um, they have book plates in there reminding you to please share them with each other. So there may be one left up at the desk. If not, there are books that you can check out right over there, whoever can get there first. <laughs> And there's a great book I can recommend, um, Reaches of the Heart, that was written by Charles White's uh, wife, his second wife, Frances. I think that's available here. Um, so just thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much.